So in the last few lectures and throughout the course, we've talked a lot about adherence. Um, we saw in the last lecture why that's so important. That without taking the medicines properly, the virus wakes up, it starts replicating again. Once it starts replicating again, it destroys the CD4 cells and goes off to infect other cells and destroy them. In doing so, it damages the immune system so that you can't be protected from infections. You can get sick and eventually can die. So we know adherence is important. Now we have to look at what can we do about it? What can we do to monitor adherence? And what can we do to measure adherence? And what do we do about it when we find poor adherence? Well, that's what this lecture is all about today, okay? So why is it important? We know, and we've seen this many times, that maintaining excellent adherence to heart is the single most important factor in ensuring successful outcomes. As I said, the medicine only works if you take it. If it sits in the bottles, it doesn't work. That doesn't stop the virus from making more of itself. The only thing that stops the virus from making more of itself is swallowing the tablets. So adherence is the single most important factor to determine whether you're going to succeed or whether you're going to fail treatment. And as we saw in the lectures with the dots and with the, the graph, that even short-term lapses, you know, missing a few doses here, a few doses there, being late with a few doses, even that can lead to resistance. And once resistance occurs, there's no going back. Once the medicine stops working because of resistance, it's not going to work again. So that's why adherence is so important. So we have to know the answers to these questions. So I'm going to ask you, what are some ways that we can measure it here? <coughs> What are some of the ways that your clinics are measuring adherence right now? Pill count. It's a very good way of measuring adherence. Is it the only way? No. Are there sometimes problems with pill counts? Yeah. What if a patient doesn't bring their pills back? What if they, they leave them at home? What if there's less pills than then when you count. And then what? Is that good adherence? Is that poor adherence? Is that too much adherence? What is that? <laughs> no, there's no such thing as too much. All right. So or maybe they're taking too much of the medicine. Maybe it's spilled. Maybe they had to repeat some doses from vomiting. What if, as is a common case, and we're going to talk about it a few times in this lecture, patients are clever, particularly teenagers who don't want to take their treatment. They know what you're doing. So they can simply count how many pills they should have taken right before they come to the clinic, take them out, throw them in the dustbin, flush them down the toilet, throw them on the side of the road, and they come back and their pill count is perfect. But now according to the new guidelines, what? When do we check their viral load? One year. When do we find out that they've been throwing out the tablets? If the only thing we're doing is pill counts, we don't find out for a year. By then, it's too late. So what's another way of measuring adherence? Viral load, right? That's a pretty darn good way, right? Because we said the only way that the, that the virus stops making more of himself is swallowing the tablets. So if the viral load is undetectable, they're probably swallowing the tablets, right? So a viral load is an excellent way of measuring adherence. What's another way? CD4 count, right? Similar to a viral load. The viral load measures the virus directly. A CD4 count measures the impact of the <coughs> virus, right? So if they're not taking their medicines, the viral load is likely high. The viral load is likely high. The virus is likely destroying many CD4 cells. 
So it's sort of a surrogate. What's another way of measuring adherence? How do we measure adherence for TB? What did everybody on TB treatment carry with them? The card and calendar, right? A tick calendar. Could you do that with HIV? Absolutely. We don't do it that commonly. We do it in my clinic sometimes, but I don't see many other clinics doing a tick calendar the same way that you do for TB, right? So that's another way. There's many, many ways, and we're going to talk about uh, a lot more ways uh, throughout this lecture. So what are some common barriers to adherence? What are some things that make people not adhere to treatment? Transport. Transport is probably one, two, and three in South Africa. The reason why people can't adhere. They can't pay for transport to get to the clinic. Or they live in an area that's too far. It takes them three hours to get to the closest clinic. It costs too much money to get to the closest clinic. And yet, the way that we had been doing treatment, and still in many places, they have to come every single month. Twelve times a year, at least, to the clinic. And that's if they're not sick and if they're doing well. So they have to pay 12 times. They have to do that transport, take a day off of work at least 12 times. So transport is a very common barrier. What else is a barrier? Side effects of the treatment, right? Particularly, what if somebody who has no symptoms whatsoever, feels perfectly fine, has a CD4 count of 190. Should they start treatment? Yes, they should. But they feel fine, right? So do people like to take medicines that might make them feel sick if they're already feeling okay? No. So side effects of the medicine can be a problem. What else? Disclosure, particularly in adults or children. If you don't understand why you're taking treatment, are you likely to take it? No. Again, in a medicine that might give you side effects or may not make you feel right, particularly in the beginning of taking it. So why would you take it? This is something that we commonly see in teenagers and children as they approach adolescence. If they're not disclosed to, they're fine, they feel great, there's no problems, right? So why am I taking this medicine? I don't think I really need it because I feel okay. So if they're not disclosed to, it can be a barrier to adherence. What else? Stigma. Huge barrier. Huge barrier. What if, and as I've seen many times, one person in the household doesn't believe that ARVs work or doesn't believe that HIV is really the cause of AIDS or a cause of sickness. And they don't want to talk about HIV in their household. But yet there's a family member on ARVs. What is that person going to do? Right? They're going to hide it. They're going to keep it secret. And so it's going to be harder for them to remember to take their treatment as opposed to somebody living in a household where there's no stigma. They're open about it. And they have treatment supporters living in their home and saying, hey, it's 8 o'clock, it's time to take your medicine. Or patient's been not feeling well for a while. Hey, you're not feeling well. Maybe this is a side effect of your ARVs. Let's go to the clinic. Right? So patients are more likely to do better in a household where there's disclosure, where there's no stigma. All right. So we're going to get into all these things. So what are some predictors of poor adherence. What's something that you might find even before they start ARVs to say, wait a second, this person might have some troubles. Um, opportunistic infections, probably not a, a predictor of poor adherence. Usually patients who are sick take their medicines pretty well. Um, unless it's something like um, HIV encephalopathy or something that makes them you know, not being able to think straight or it's too sick to actually get to the clinic. Um, and that actually happens not infrequently. The patients are so sick that they can't get to the clinic. Okay. 
different. And remember, they have to get there every month. So the first few months, they might be too sick to even get to the clinic. So denial, right? If they're not uh, believing that they're HIV positive or not believing that HIV is the cause of their illness, <coughs> then they won't likely take their treatment very well. Right, and that's a very common one and probably one of the most important ones. So alcohol and drug abuse. If they're taking alcohol, continuing to take drugs, they're likely to not live a normal hourly lifestyle. Um, you know, if you're out drinking and you pass out drunk before 8 o'clock, you didn't take your treatment, right? right? Or if you're out night partying all night, what are the chances you're going to say, oh, it's half seven, it's time for me to take my treatment. No, it's pretty unlikely, pretty unlikely. All right. So what are some things that we can do to improve adherence? So disclosure, absolutely. In a, in a child who doesn't, isn't taking treatment, or an adolescent or teenager not taking their treatment, and you suspect it's because they don't know why they're taking treatment. Disclosure can be a very important part of improving their adherence. What else? Having a treatment supporter is very important. Now, what I see in most clinics <laughs> is a treatment supporter is a job for, for how long? For, no, but what I see, that's true, it should be lifelong, but what I see is one day. A treatment supporter is the person who comes to their third module, sits down, listens to one class, and then that's it. Right? But really, if you're agreeing to be a treatment supporter, it should be a lifelong decision. So when a patient's adherence isn't very good, you could be able to go to the treatment supporter and say, hey, what's going on? You should be helping. It's part of your job, too, to help assist. Or a person's getting sick, you know, and they've been sick for a long time. Well, hey, treatment supporter, it's your job to get that person to come to the clinic. Tell us what's going on. Are they not taking their treatment? Are they having side effects of their medicines? So really a treatment supporter is a lifelong commitment, not a one-day commitment as it actually in reality turns out to be many of the times. All right. so what's another way to improve adherence? Right, so there are ways to even, if we know that transport is a major barrier, we can do things about it, right? Maybe give them two months at a time. Maybe give them three months at a time. If they're well, they've shown that their adherence is good, that their problem is just getting to the clinic, paying to getting to the clinic, give them a few months of medicines at a time. Maybe have mobile clinics, right? Uh, that goes at more close to their home. Or refer them to a site that's actually closer to their home. Um, a local clinic may now, now that we're doing uh, more initiations at local clinics, maybe their local clinic does ARVs now. So instead of having them travel far, far, far to get to your center, maybe there's one that's already doing ARVs near their house. So really, if we're going to do something about the adherence, if we're going to improve the adherence, you have to find poor adherence. And really that's the most important thing, is how do you find Poor adherence, you need to look for it first, right? So how do you look for it first? The only way to do something about poor adherence is to first identify it. So what are the ways to identify it? Well, there's lots of ways, and I know you can't read this on the screen, but you have it uh, in your notes. Um, there's lots of ways to measure adherence. And these are the ways to measure adherence for everything, not just ARVs for everything. So the first thing shh, the first thing is directly observed therapy. Is that a good way of measuring adherence? Yeah, it's probably one of the best. You have somebody physically watch them swallow the tablet, right? Well, we commonly use that in the United States for TB therapy, right? What happens is a community health care worker goes, knocks on the door. They say, hello, I'm the community health care worker. I'm here to observe you take your TB treatment today. 
They say, okay, let me see the pill. They see, take the pill, put it in their mouth, swallow it, say, open your mouth, let me see that you swallowed it. Okay, nothing in there. Goodbye, I'm going to the next person. Of course, that takes a lot of time, right? It takes a lot of money. Going house to house to house, make sure that they take their treatment every day. And for something like ARVs, which until now were twice a day, even more impractical. So can you use directly observed therapy as a way to monitor HIV? Right. Yes, you can. You can. Because you can have a family member do it, a treatment supporter do it. This is a very common way we have of monitoring children, right? A person gives them the medicine, watches them take the medicine, watches them swallow the medicine. That's directly observed therapy. This is a common way that I employ, particularly for adolescents, teenagers who are having problems with adherence. You use directly observed therapy. Take their parent, their guardian, their caregiver, and say, no, it's your job now to give the medicines every day. You watch the child take the medicine. You watch the child swallow the medicine. Okay? So you can use directly observed therapy. Some people measure, said, uh, you know, certain things you can measure in the blood. You can measure like a viral load, right? It's a surrogate of, if it's undetectable, you know they're probably taking it. Same is true for a CD4, it's sort of a surrogate. Well, for some drugs, you can actually measure the level of drug in the blood. You know, sort of like that graph. You can actually see where it is. Is it between the toxicity level and the level that it actually works? Of course, that's a very expensive way. It's not really readily available, um, particularly here in South Africa. But for other things, we do. For seizure medicines, you know, when somebody comes in with a seizure, the number one reason is they're not taking their medicine. So you check their blood, and you find their level is undetectable. Well, you know they're not taking it. So it is a, one way that you can use. Um, so those are really the main direct ways to measure adherence. You can use directly observed therapy, you could measure the blood uh, for the drug itself, or measure either a metabolite of it, or a surrogate, like a viral load or CD4. And so there are other indirect methods of measuring adherence. <coughs> so one method, in some clinics they use a patient questionnaire. And they say, in the last five days, how many times have you missed your treatment? And the patients say, well, I missed like twice in the last five days. So it can give you a good sense of how often do they miss their treatment. You know? So is that a very accurate way of measuring? Not necessarily, right? If I think the patient's honest and says, you know, in the last five days I missed two doses, I always miss on, you know, or I always miss Thursdays because I'm traveling or something. And you can find detailed information about it. But what happens most of the time is patients, you ask a patient, have you missed any doses of your medicines? They tell you, no. Despite the pill counts having full bottles of medicine and their viral load being 100,000, right? <laughs> they say, no, I never miss. And you look at their bottle, and it's a full bottle from three months ago. Well, they're not taking it. Right? Pill counts is another way, right, we talked about. So the patient comes to the clinic, they collect a certain number of pills, we know how much we've given them, they come back and see us, we know how many days it's been, we know how many doses they should have taken, we can simply count the number of pills that remain and know how many are missing, how many did they take. So it's a very good way, it's an objective way of measuring how they're doing. But is it perfect? No. Medicines spill. Sometimes they don't bring the medicines back. Sometimes, we've seen this several times, the bottle has 64 tablets in it, but it says it has 60. Right? Or it has 58, and it says it has 60. We've seen this several times where you open up a brand new sealed bottle 
count the number of tablets in it, and it's not 60, it's 61, it's 62, it's 64 sometimes. So here you're yelling at a patient, hey, you've missed four doses. What are you doing? This is terrible. But yet they're actually taking it properly. Because sometimes it's not packed properly. So pill cows aren't perfect, but they do give you a sense of what's going on. You know, you see a patient in clinic, which happens all the time. Actually happened to me yesterday, I saw uh, an adolescent who was on treatment. Um, the viral load came back and it was elevated. And I asked, have you been taking your treatment? He says, yes, every time, I never miss. Well, then I go back to the pill counts. And guess what? Doesn't balance. Doesn't balance. Doesn't balance. Month after month after month. Right? And so another problem what happens with the pill counts is what the counselors are doing is focusing on the pill count and not what we should do about it. Not the implication of it. I used to go to a clinic, which is represented here today, I know some people that work there, where they used to pill count every single patient every time they came to the clinic. And guess what? They did absolutely nothing about it. Their entire file was filled with papers with pill counts. But when you get the viral load back, it's 100,000. You know? Patients failing treatment for one year, two years on treatment. Viral load six months ago, 25,000. Viral load today, 50,000. Look back a year ago, what was the viral load? 35,000. Guess what? You've got, you know, 24 pill counts all done. Per and you see, no, missing doses, missing doses, missing doses, missing doses, missing doses. So they did the pill count, they did the viral load, but never did anything about it. This happened for hundreds of patients at this clinic. So they did what they were supposed to do with the pill counts, they did what they were supposed to do with drawing the blood, but they never addressed the problem. So all these monitors of adherence only work if you do something about it. So it's one thing to do the pill count, but when you find it doesn't balance, find out why. See what's going on, what's happening, why is the pill count not balanced. So you're going to address it and try to fix the problem. That's the reason for doing all of these methods of monitoring adherence. You can do rates of prescription refill. Several clinics do this. Instead of counting the individual tablets, which is quite time consuming, you simply know when their treatment should be finished and make sure that they return before that date. So if they were given a 30-day supply of medicines and they come back in 35 days, you know that there's a gap there. Mm -hmm. They missed five days of treatment somehow because you only gave them 30 days worth. So that's another method. Again, it's not perfect. If a patient comes back on time every 28 days, doesn't necessarily mean they're taking the treatment. They may have a closet full of medicine somewhere that they're not taking. So that's another way. There are even more sophisticated and very fancy ways, which are particularly used in research studies, where you actually have a bottle where the cap is electronic, and it knows every time you open the lid. It can record the date and time. So again, this isn't perfect because patients can just open it and close it. Right? But it gives you a sense, if the patients aren't playing tricks and playing games with you, it gives you a sense of how much they're taking their treatment. But of course, these things are expensive and not readily available, but they are used for research studies to make sure the patients are taking their treatment properly. And then there's sort of low-tech ways, like the tick calendar, or a patient diary, where they take home a calendar, and each time they take the medicine, they either tick it or write down the actual time that they took the medicine. 
if they use it properly and are, use it honestly, can be a very good way of finding out where the problems are. I often use this when patients aren't balancing and we can't find out why. I give them a one month supply of treatment, give them a calendar and tell them every month, I mean every time you take a dose, write down what time it is. If they use it properly, you can see, oh, you know what, they miss the Tuesday morning dose every time. And so you can say, Why, what happens on Tuesday mornings? Oh, well that's the day that the go-go goes and travels somewhere, or goes somewhere, and so she doesn't monitor the treatment. And so the child doesn't take it. Or maybe it's, you know, Thursday nighttime dose. Why is the Thursday nighttime dose? Every week you're missing the Thursday nighttime. Oh, that's because I travel late and I'm stuck on a taxi and I don't get back in time. So you, if they use it properly, you can see. If they don't use it properly, what you'll find is them sitting in the waiting room writing in 888888888, you know, and that's not very helpful. Okay, that's not very helpful. Okay. But these are all different ways that you can use to help measure adherence. Okay? I've highlighted here uh, and sort of talked about the most likely ones that we are to use and that we do use and should be using and that's directly observed therapy. You can use a parent, caregiver, treatment supporter to observe the patient taking the treatment. We measure a biologic marker like a CD4 or a viral load. Very good way of assessing adherence. We use pill counts. Count the number of tablets they should be making. We use rates of prescription refills. If we know we gave them a 30-day supply and they come back in 60 days, they missed. They come back in 32 days, we know they've missed. Okay? So not even having to do the full pill count. Right? And then, the other thing, probably the most important thing and we didn't talk about, is the patient's clinical response. Are they getting better? If they're getting better and healthier, they're gaining weight, they're not having opportunistic infections, well, they're probably taking their treatment. So we need to, res to monitor their clinical response too. And then I think patient diaries, if they used properly and tick calendars, can be a very helpful way of assessing if there might be a systematic problem in taking the medicine and where it lies. Okay. Any questions about measuring it here? Pretty clear. Okay. So <clears throat> the second question I posed to you was what are some common barriers to adherence? So there's all, many, many different barriers, and I think the barriers are amplified in certain <coughs> clinical settings, particularly uh, here in South Africa. But there's different levels of barriers. Some are on the patient level, some are on the clinic level, and some are really on the country and institutional level. So patient level, what if they don't understand the treatment, right? So there's lack of disclosure, or patients don't really understand what, why they need to take treatment, or why adherence is so important. In children, a very common barrier to adherence is change of caregivers. The mother was the caregiver, she never started ARVs, and she died. And now, who takes care of the child? Maybe it's auntie, maybe it's gogo. -go. But maybe that person wasn't trained. Maybe they don't even know the child's HIV positive. They don't know the side effects of the medicines. They don't know the right times. They don't know about adherence. So this is commonly a problem we see in children. Particularly because the most common caregiver that we see giving a child medicines is probably not the mother. It's the go go, it's the grandmother. Some of them are quite old. And some of them die. And so then who gives the medicine to the child? So if there's a change of caregivers, particularly if there's a change of caregivers and we don't recognize it, we don't realize that there's been a change of caregivers, that can be a huge barrier to adherence. Lack of disclosure to all caregivers. As I said, if patients shuffling off to different caregivers and they're not disclosed to, then they're unlikely to give the medicines. This is something we see every single year during the holidays. 
what happens during the holidays? Children travel, right? They go to visit family members, oftentimes without the primary caregiver. So they'll go off to Auntie in the Eastern Cape. And Auntie doesn't know the child's HIV positive. And so for the entire school holidays, child doesn't take treatment. Another way we see this, probably even more common than that, is the mom is the primary caregiver. But on weekends, goes to dad. Mom never disclosed to dad. Right? Mom never disclosed her own or the child's status to the father. So he doesn't know the child's taking medicine, so guess what? Has great adherence five days a week. And then on weekends, doesn't take treatment. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. So change of caregivers is commonly a problem. What about age-appropriate information not given to the child? They're not disclosed to. They don't understand why they're taking the treatment. It could be a problem. Okay. Misinformation given to the child. Again, something we see in children very commonly. There was a child that I saw a few years ago now who had very good adherence until we found out why she thought she was taking treatment. We asked her, why do you take treatment? And she said, no, I, I take my treatment every day, twice a day. I know I must take it. Because if I don't take it, worms live in my stomach and they're going to crawl out of my mouth. Well, that is very good motivation to take treatment. But it's not the truth. And this child needs to take treatment for the rest of her life. So at some point, she's going to need to learn the truth. So when she found out the truth, she wasn't very happy about it. She had been lied to for years. And so now she wasn't very keen on taking treatment because she knew worms weren't going to come crawling out of her mouth. Right? So misinformation given. You know, a lot of times children are told they take their treatment for TB. But TB treatment isn't lifelong, is it? They'll say, hey, I knew, you know, my brother had TB or my friend had TB, they took it for six months. Why do I need to keep taking it? I'll just stop, because it's been past six months. Okay, so misinformation. Some of the medicines don't taste very well, particularly for the children, like Kalichir we talked about. Ritonavir is even worse, the liquid formulation. So sometimes they don't taste well, so the children, even infants, will spit out Kalichir or Ritonavir because the taste is so bad. Pill burden. Luckily now we're having less pill burden. We're, there's more medicines available that you can take once a day or take all at the same time. The new formulation of Alluvia is two tablets twice a day. The old Kalitra was three tablets twice a day. So the more pills you take, people just don't want to take lots of pills. Treatment fatigue we see in everybody on treatment. Everybody on chronic treatment who is doing well will usually develop treatment fatigue. So what is treatment fatigue? Well, it, it actually, HIV leads into almost everybody likely to get treatment fatigue. Because who's likely to get treatment fatigue? It's somebody who's asymptomatic, who needs to take medicines every day. So they feel fine. Maybe they were sick in the beginning when they started treatment, but that was two years ago. I'm fine now. My weight is good, I'm healthy, I'm working, I'm exercising. I'm perfectly fine. I don't need this medicine anymore. And that's what treatment fatigue is. The longer patients need to take medicines, the more likely they are to develop treatment fatigue. And as of now, antiretroviral therapy is lifelong. So believe in cures. As I told you, there's lots of people out there willing to sell you things that will cure you of HIV. The problem is they don't work. So if you believe in a cure and are willing to pay for something, you're unlikely to take ARVs because you'd much rather take something once off and be cured than take something once or twice a day for the rest of your life. 
Of course, stigma we talked about is a big problem. If the caregiver is disabled, unable to get to the clinic, as we said, if they're too sick to get to the clinic, they might not be able to give it. Where the caretaker is not at home, this is a common problem um, that we see is caretaker is not at home when the time of the medicine needs to be taken. Maybe you need to change the timing or maybe you need to change the caregiver. I remember there was one case of a child who had very, very poor adherence. Very poor. Didn't take their medicines very well. And it seems like the morning dose was missed every day. Every single day, seven days a week, they missed their morning dose. Their evening dose was right on time. He said, how is it possible that they take the evening dose every single time but doesn't take the morning dose seven days a week? That's because the go-go who was giving the treatment she went to church seven days a week in the morning. So she thought it was more important to go to church than to give her child medicines or to work out an arrangement to get the child treatment while she went to church okay, or change the timing of treatment so that she could still go to church and take the treatment. Okay. Poor self-esteem or depression. If you have poor self-esteem or depressed, and maybe you don't want to live, why would you take medicines to make you live longer? This is commonly a problem in adolescence. And depression is very common in adolescence. Poor self-esteem is very common in adolescence, particularly if you're HIV positive, particularly if you're undisclosed to. Research studies have shown, and you're going to see this in the disclosure lecture, that children who are disclosed to, particularly earlier, have higher self-esteem. Well, why is that? Well, because there's no secrets anymore. You know, oftentimes when we do disclosure, you're going to hear this in the disclosure lecture, and I'm disclosing to a child, and I ask them, why do you take your treatment? Usually they don't say anything. And then, so you press them, no, tell me, why are you taking your treatment? And they usually glance at the caregiver a little awkwardly. I say, no, please tell me, give me some answer. Just give me, take a wild guess. You know, I know it could be anything in the world. You don't really know why you're taking treatment. Take a wild guess. And what do they all say? They say HIV. It's not a guess. They knew but their caregiver had been hiding it from them. Most of these children, they're not stupid. They come to the clinic every month. They hear people talking. They see commercials. They might have the same medicines that they're taking. They see other people taking the same medicines. They're clever. They know that they're HIV positive. But what does it do to you if you have an illness, but nobody wants to talk about it? We want to keep it a secret from you that you have this illness. Does that make you feel good about yourself? No. It makes you think that maybe you're the problem, not the disease. Maybe it's me that they, why they don't want to talk about it. So poor self-esteem in an undisclosed child is very, very common. Particularly as they get older and older and older and it's still being a secret, still being a secret. Okay. Medicine sharing. This is something that is extremely common much more common than any of us realize. In a household where there's a couple, a man and a woman, who's got the treatment? It's the woman, right? The woman's positive. The man is probably unknown, right? He doesn't go to the clinic. He's a man. Right? So he doesn't need medicines. He doesn't need to check himself. He feels fine. Until what happens? until he gets sick. And where's the first place he's going to go? Is it to the clinic? No, it's to the bottles, right? He's going to take the medicines. Not his medicine, somebody else's medicine. Right? So medicine sharing is something that happens very, very commonly. Very commonly. So a lot of times it's men who are taking women's treatment um, because they live in a household where or in a culture where men don't want to go to the clinic, they don't want to know their HIV status, 
and they don't want to be seen as taking medicines. So they go off and sneak a few pills every now and then. And when they do that, do they take all three? No. They'll probably take one. Do they take it every day? No. Do they take it twice a day? No. So what's that doing? It's causing resistance. It's causing resistance. All right. Inability to obtain medicines for whatever reasons. Transport, lack of money, your boss won't let you off work. Whatever the reason, if you can't get the medicine, you can't swallow the medicine. Lack of funds, we've talked about transport, often a problem. Insufficient food or water in the home um, to take the medicines properly, problem. Um, lack of appropriate storage, some of the medicines need to be refrigerated. We don't use uh, many of them here in South Africa, but the D4T liquid needs to be refrigerated. Um, and really, a very common reason is just the lack of a social support system. If you have a treatment supporter who's with you for more than the day for Module 3 and actually does support you, your chance of having adherence is much, much, much better. Okay? So those are the personal levels. But what about the clinic level? What are things that we're doing that prevent patients from taking treatment well? Well, there's inadequate assessment of readiness, which happens very frequently. What if a patient's very sick and in the hospital and so we quickly start ARVs, maybe not even put them through the training modules, and then they get discharged home and they don't know why they're taking treatment. They don't understand the importance of adherence. They may not know the side effects of the medicines. So if we don't do proper pre-assessment, we don't already look for these barriers and try to address them early on, then we're the problem of the patient not succeeding. Okay? Inadequate assessment of ongoing adherence, like that clinic I was telling you about, doing the pill counts. Well, they did assess adherence, they just didn't do anything about it, right? And that's really the same thing. Yeah. Or in other clinics, there was another clinic that I worked at, and they didn't do pill counts, they didn't do pharmacy refills, they didn't really do anything. They really just saw whether the patients clinically were doing okay or not. They did the CD4s and viral loads too. And so I said, oh, how are you guys assessing adherence? And they said, well, you know, we assess clinically and CD4s and viral loads. And, you know, it's really not that big of a deal in our clinic. <coughs> our patients' adherence is very good. But then the viral loads are coming back, elevated. Elevated, elevated. More and more patients, elevated viral loads, elevated viral loads. Having to switch to second line, having to switch to second line, having to switch to second line. And why? Because they weren't assessing adherence. They thought they were, they were doing viral loads, right? But if that's all you do, particularly now when you're checking it once a year, it's too late. It's too late. By that point, the patient's resistant. If you do something maybe every month or every two months to assess adherence and you find they were good, they were good, they were good, now there's a problem, you can address it. Fix it before the patient is resistant. So if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. So some clinics don't have proper pediatric formulations. Makes it difficult to give medicines to children. Lack of time personnel for in the clinics, another one of these clinics, well, the clinic that did all the pill counts but didn't counsel the patients, I asked them why not. They said, well, we don't have time. We're too busy doing the pill counts. <laughs> I think their focus was a bit wrong, right? And they're focused on the task but not why the task is being done. Right? You look for poor adherence so you can address poor adherence, not just write it down on paper. Medicine stockouts, still a problem sometimes, particularly in rural clinics. As we know, the free state had the major problem of about six to nine months <coughs> where the entire province had nothing. So medicine stockouts are still a problem. They are still a problem. It's less and less, I think, but when we do see it actually more so than not is in the pediatric formulation because they often don't stock a lot of extra pediatric formulations. So you'll si find some of the liquid medicines stock out, stock outs. 
So something we do still see. Inappropriate dosing, again, something we see uh, really two major occasions. One is children and two is people on Kaletra and TB treatment. Okay? The doses need to be adjusted. One child who had probably the worst resistance I've ever seen had, was basically resistant to every ARV medicine by the time they came to me was because of inappropriate dosing. The child started ARVs at a private physician and started on a Kaletra based regimen. It was an older child but started a Kaletra based regimen. The child at one point developed TB. They never adjusted the dose. The child had pretty good adherence to treatment. The mom was actually a nurse. Took the medicine pretty well. Was on treatment with this private physician for a few years. Started treatment when he was about five years old. Came to me when he was about eight years old. How much weight do you gain in those three years? Quite a bit. Particularly if you were malnourished, skinny before you started ARVs, right? And guess what? In three years, they never increased the dose of the child's medicine. It was on the same dose he started at day one when he was five years old. Now he's eight years old. He also had TB treatment in the middle of that. So how much resistance did he have? A lot. A lot. So much so that even second line, by that time, even second line, he was resistant. And we didn't really have many options for him. Why? It was the doctor's fault of inappropriate dosing. Their adherence was fine. But inappropriate dosing can do that. So what are some predictors of poor adherence? Okay. Well, we mentioned a lot of them. Psychological problems. Depression is a very common one. Cognitive impairment. If you're having HIV encephalopathy, it's hard for you to remember to take your medicine. Side effects of the medicines was mentioned before. Okay, if you're not, the medicines don't make you feel well, you probably aren't going to want to take them. Alcohol and drugs. Poor patient-provider relationships. Well, there's really not a clinic in South Africa that I've really been to that has a good patient-provider relationship. Because what happens is the patients sit in the queue, right? And who do they see? Do they see their doctor? No, they see whosoever's, whosoever's door opens next, right? They might see four doctors, five different doctors. They might see a doctor and a nurse, two nurses, three different counselors. And they don't establish that one-on-one -on -one relationship very well. So most patients actually do not have a very good provider-patient relationship. Complexity of treatment. We mentioned this with DDI. has to be taken on an empty stomach. Kaletra needs to be taken with food. So in the old formulations, you had to take a medicine on an empty stomach, wait, take another medicine, and then in the evening, the same thing. It's, so you're taking medicines four times a day, which can be quite difficult. It can be quite difficult. And then, of course, transportation, we've heard over and over again. So, what if we're the clinic that was doing the pill counts on every single patient, finding them bad, having high viral loads, what can we do about it? Well, I think the first and most important thing is to look for poor adherence. If you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. The clinic that said, no, our clinic is fine. Our patients have good adherence. But they didn't. And why did they say their patients had good adherence? They weren't looking for it. If you look for it, you're going to find it. So you can look for missed refills, as we said, pill counts. Try to evaluate the barriers. What, what is the problem of the patient not taking the treatment? Is it because Gogo -Go is going to church every morning instead of giving the treatment? Well, maybe they need a new caregiver or a plan that somebody else gives the medicine in the morning. Maybe mom works nights and can't give the evening dose. Well, then somebody else needs to, do, to give it or somebody else or some other plan needs to be put in place. But you're not going to find a solution to that plan until you find out what the problem is. So you need to identify it first. And of course, disclosure. 
emphasizing the value and the impact of taking treatment and why it's important to take it every day. You know, a lot of times it's a patient who's working shift work and say, well, I'm working during when I'm supposed to take my stoker and so I can't take it. As I said, you can take it in the morning time. Changing regimens, doing something, maybe changing the medicines themselves. So, it, you know, so they're taking tenofovir, stokrin, and lamivudine, and they can take it all once a day. Maybe that can save the problem. Okay? So try to simplify things. Encourage the use of a medicine-taking system. A lot of patients do this on their own. I joke about it, but a lot of adults take their medicines at 8 and 8. And why do they take it at 8 and 8? Because 8 o'clock is when generations comes on. And when the generations come on, they know it's time to take their treatment. They never miss generations, so they're never going to miss their treatment. Right? So it's a system. It's a way to involve it and incorporate it into your life. Okay? Some people use pill boxes, using a tick calendar. Okay? There's lots of things you can do to make it part of a system. Okay? And I think this is one of the most important things. Listen to the patient and customize the regimen. So find out what is the problem and try to match it. 8 and 8 is not the right times for everybody. Some need to take it at different times. Maybe once a day is better than twice a day. In some people, maybe twice a day is better than once a day. So see what, what you can do and work with the patients. Okay? And of course, obtain help from the family members. Involve that treatment supporter. Bring in more treatment supporters if necessary to try to take the medicines. Okay? One of the most difficult patients I have in the clinic is a teenage girl who does not want to take her treatment. We have tried absolutely everything. But she's of course a teenage girl who's asymptomatic. She's disclosed, she knows why she's taking the treatment, but she feels fine so she doesn't want to take it. I have less problem blaming her than I do in blaming her mother, who's also on treatment but yet refuses to supervise the child properly and watch her take the medicine and encourage her to take the treatment. And if the mom can take the treatment every day, she should be able to take the same medicine at the same time as the child and encourage her to take it. So the more family members you involve and the more that you help can assist in, in, in better adherence. Okay? Um, reinforce desirable behavior when appropriate. Now this is something I do with all my patients. When their viral load is undetectable, when their pill counts balance, you know, congratulate them. Tell them you're doing a great job, you're doing fantastic. I know it's difficult to take medicines every day, but you're doing a great job, keep it up. If you keep it up, you're going to live a long, healthy, productive life. Simple messages like that, they're reinforcing. You know, children sometimes, you know, they get an undetectable viral load, I'll give them a sweet, I'll give them some stickers. Okay, reinforce desirable behaviors. It's a very good uh, method of improving adherence. In some patients, it's harder to do in South Africa, but in, in certain places you can consider a forgiving medicine, like Kalitra. It doesn't need to be taken as often. So if you know a patient's having trouble with their medicines and there's really nothing you can do, you've tried everything, they can't take their medicines every day, on time, maybe Kalitra is a good option, better than nothing. Okay. Unfortunately, these two are not yet available, like depot medicines, you know, they're very effective. You give one shot once a month, that would be great. Unfortunately, there is none of that for ARVs. Transdermal medicines, medicines you can put on the skin, absorbed over a long period of time. Unfortunately, again, there's no uh, ARV that works like that. So how do we promote good adherence? Okay. Well, you start early on. You start even before they're on treatment. Start early on, you do an adherence assessment. It's the whole purpose of the assessing readiness lecture. And develop a plan for starting hard. How are they going to adhere to the treatment? Okay. Once they're on treatment, you assess adherence at every single visit, however it is that your clinic does it. How are they doing clinically? And if you do my little six-step checklist, you will do this several times. So how are they doing clinically? That monitors adherence. How are they doing virologically? That monitors adherence. 
How are they doing immunologically? That monitors adherence. What is their pill count? Okay. So most of the ways we're monitoring their adherence. How are they doing with taking it? If you find a systematic problem, troubleshoot it. If you find poor adherence, it doesn't do any good to have a whole stack of papers with poor pill counts. Once you find the poor pill counts, try to find out why. What's the problem? What's going on that they're not taking their treatment properly? Is it because they travel on weekends to visit the father? Is it because the mom works at night and isn't coming back in time for the child to take the treatment? What is the problem? And try to address it and fix it. And maybe it's a program problem. Maybe your clinic doesn't assess adherence properly. Like the clinic I told you where they said they had great adherence. Well, they had great adherence because they never looked at adherence. So maybe it's a, a program problem. Okay? Maybe they need to incorporate a better way of monitoring adherence. And review procedures uh, that are being implemented. Maybe you need to change the modules, your teaching, your training system before patients take treatment. Sometimes uh, it's best to have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session. When it, poor adherence is identified, have a counseling session and have the counselors try to identify what the problem is. Some clinics, in uh, my clinic at Don McKenzie, we've started what we call Module 4, which is an additional training for people who have had poor adherence or have had difficulty taking their treatment. <coughs> so it's an additional uh, teaching session to teach them more about HIV and about adherence and about resistance and try to troubleshoot common problems of taking medicines. So we introduce a group session of, of um, sort of module four. And at each visit, it's really not the doctor's job to assess adherence. It's not the nurse's job to assess adherence. It's not the counselor's job to assess adherence. It's everybody's job to assess adherence. So there should be implemented into the clinic and into the system a way that everybody can monitor the adherence. So there's several ways to do it, as we said. But we estimate adherence either by pill count or however you do it. And if it's less than 95%, if they're taking medicines less than 95% of the time, then they're at risk of resistance. So if you're taking medicines over 95% of the time, then adherence is okay. So what is 95% of the time? Well, in a medicine that you take twice a day for one month, if they miss three or more doses, that's less than 95% of the time. That's poor adherence. That's chance of getting resistance. If it's a medicine that's once a day, and they miss more than one time per month, that's less than 95%. So that's a chance of getting resistance. So it's important to know about how much are they missing. If it's a medicine that's twice a day and they miss it only once a month, it's really not likely to be a problem of, that's going to lead to resistance. Okay. Repeatedly over time and over time over time it might, but their adherence is over 95% it's unlikely to develop resistance. Okay. So in a child, we should engage them in an age-appropriate way. So disclosing to the child at an early age, teaching them about the medicines, teaching them the names of the medicines, teaching them the times of the medicines, getting them involved in their own care. The earlier they do that, the better self-esteem they will have and the more likely they are to take the medicines properly. And then, of course, follow-up, as I said, it's a team approach. Everybody needs to be involved. The doctor, the nurse, the counselors, the pharmacists, in assessing it, addressing it, and trying to come up with problems to it. Okay. Um, certain things that we can use, we've said uh, again and again, you can use pill calendars, a ticked calendar. If the problem is the go-go can't measure the treatment properly in a syringe, you can label the syringe with the proper dose. So they just fill it up to that line. Um, so they don't have to even know the proper dose, just know it, that it's filled to the line. Use picture medicine guides so they know the pictures or have the actual pills and say this is the medicine you take once a day, this is twice a day, you take two of this, one of this. 
Okay, so they actually see the medicines instead of just learning their names. Pill boxes are a very good way. I know they're not readily available, but they're an excellent way uh, of patients to help patients with poor adherence. And I said reward patients either verbal praise with stickers, with sweets, something for good adherence. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip some of those. So there are particularly patients that are difficult to address and difficult to deal with. It's adolescents, it's elderly, it's infants and children, and the mentally disabled. And here's a few tips um, that you can use for these specific groups to try to improve adherence. So adolescents, as we talked about, they often have poor adherence because of many reasons. Adolescents in general feel invincible. They feel like they can't be hurt, nothing's going to kill them, they're going to be fine. It's just common mentality of, a, of an adolescent. Oftentimes, by this time, they're on treatment for a while, so they're asymptomatic. And of course, HIV is a chronic disease, needing lifelong medicines. And again, depression often plays a role in the adolescence. Okay. So what can you do to address this group? Well, you can see them more frequently, okay, to assess adherence more frequently. You can see them in a group situation, like I've started up my teenage clinic where we see all the teenagers together. And so they can bond with each other. They can talk to each other. They can see that there's other children just like them. You know, one of the important things in an adolescent's life is to be just like everybody else. You know, you want to fit into the group. If you remember from the video we saw, Living with Slim, you remember Eva, the girl in the red dress. She said, one of the hardest things for me is I wanted to be like everybody else. She said, but I'm not like everybody else. I have HIV. Well, what if you came to a group where everybody had HIV? Then you are just like everybody else. You are part of the group. You are a normal teenager. And that's one thing that seeing um, teenagers and adolescents in a group situation in an adolescent uh, teen clinic can do. They can also talk to each other. You know, how do you take your treatment when you go out to the movies at night? Do you put it in your pocket? What do you do? They can talk to each other. Right? To come up with their own strategies, to come up with some of the problems they face in their daily lives. Okay. So, the tools we use. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of some of the tools that I use to help with adherence in some of my patients. So, you can use the pharmacy record. As we said, you record the, the date the medicines work. And this is a, uh, a method to do uh, basically a pill count. You record the date the medicines were given, how many of the medicines were given, and how much is returned. That allows for calculation of a pill count and a percent adherence. You can use pill calendars, a tick calendar like you use for TB. Okay. This is an example of one week of a medicine that's twice a day or a regimen that's twice a day. And they simply can either tick, Xani, Bsuku, so morning, night, this is, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way up. They can tick throughout the week, right? Or even better, what I prefer is instead of ticking, is to write down the actual time that they took it, you know? If it go through and it says 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, you know that they're not using it properly. But if it says 758, 802, 815, 745, you know that they're probably using it properly and those are probably accurate times. And then maybe you find out that, you know, it's one of these days, one of the, there's a problem. And so you can find systematic problems that way. And then there's pill counting. How many people here know how to do a pill count? Nobody. Counselors. Nobody knows how to do a pill count. Okay, well here's how you do it. So we count the number of days since the medicine was refilled. Okay, the number of di that was dispensed. And then calculate the number uh, that they should have taken you find out how many times, how many days they've been gone, so how many uh, should have been taken, and then you just simply count 
the number of pills remaining. Okay? And then you can calculate a percentage uh, that they've taken overall. So I have a few examples here. Uh, there's two examples in your notes. You can actually uh, try to do that at home and practice because it will show up on uh, exams. I guarantee it. Um, so you can go through it, uh, the, the calculations. There's two examples in your, in your homework or in your notes there. Okay. Any questions?